everyone. We are live in the Book Conservation Lab of the Smithsonian Libraries. We'll get started in just a few seconds. Thanks for joining us. In the meantime, if you have any questions, um, please be sure to let us know. If we don't get to them through the uh, course of this broadcast, we're happy to answer them after the fact in a comment. So if you have questions along the way, please let us know. We're doing this in celebration of Preservation Week which ends tomorrow, Saturday. Thanks for joining us, folks. We'll get started in just a few seconds. We are live behind the scenes in the Book Conservation Lab of the Smithsonian Libraries. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. We'll get started here in just a minute. And I'm behind the camera, I'm Erin Rushing, the Outreach Librarian. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to our real stars of the show today. Uh, Katie and Don in our Book Conservation Lab. So Katie and Don, why don't you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you do here. Okay, I'm Katie Wagner. I'm a book conservator for Smithsonian Libraries and I work primarily with the rare material we have. We have 2.5 million books, uh, 50,000 rare. And I'm Don Stan Cabbage. I'm a library technician. I work primarily on repairing the general collection or circulating materials and I also do a lot of work with commercial binding. Great. So I'm just going to pan across so people can see this big, beautiful open space that we have to work with and where we'll be touring today. This is the Book Conservation Lab. And we're going to start over here in Katie's bench. And Katie's going to walk us through some of her repairs. Yeah, so I put out a couple of different cleaning techniques that we use. This is um, eraser crumbs. So material comes to us in a couple different ways. It comes through um, scanning. So if somebody actually, a user requested this item for scanning, it's obviously disbound and very dirty. So we'd like it to look a little nicer before we scan it. The other way we get books is just through, you know, if somebody needs something fixed, we have an allocation, they send it our way, or through our adopt a book program where you can go on our website and adopt a book for acquisitions or preservation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But one way to clean is with these eraser crumbs. These are a medium grade eraser crumb that have been a Mars Stadler that's been ground up. And we literally shake it out. And then we rub in a circular motion. And this removes some of the surface dirt that you see here. Just like erasing a pencil mark. Exactly. But this is going to be a lot more gentle because they're tiny little granules and not a, uh, a big eraser. And then you can see when I wipe these away, those have picked up, they were white, and now they oh, are wow. dirty. You can see just how dirty they got. That's so cool. Yeah, and that was just a little bit. Um, another option, and you know, you get to get, you get to know the different dirt that books can have <laughs> when you work with them a lot is soot. So this, um, because I've worked with it a lot, I can tell this is soot on a, we have a lot of these um, material sample books. This is from the Dibner Library, and this is different dyes for this, uh, looks like a silk fiber. And what, what I was going to use here is a soot sponge. It's actually a large rubber sponge that we cut into pieces, small pieces to use on this material. And it, um, we try to be gentle, but it really picks that soot right up. Wow. And you can see it's on the sponge. And we can just keep, keep going here. Wow. So that's a soot sponge. And the other option, which is the most time intensive and also maybe a little bit traumatic, changes the paper a little bit, is actually washing. A lot of these older papers are made with cotton and linen fibers, so like your clothes, you can actually wash them. Obviously, it has to be something disbound, so it's something you're going to re-sew, or maybe it's already disbound and you haven't re-sewn it yet. And we'll look at that sink a little bit later. This is one of our adopted books. This was actually adopted by Dr. Scorton. Yeah, and thank you, Dr. Scorton. <laughs> yes, thank you very much for preservation. And we wanted to keep as much as the, of the original binding as possible. It's hard to tell, but this is an old marbled paper. And oh, I'm kind of something in the color there. Yeah. Because so we really, we didn't want to rebind this or anything aggressive. We just wanted to shore up this area with bare board. And we toned a piece of Japanese uh, paint. 
paper to complement the original weather color. And then we adhered it with isinglass. And I've, it's kind of an interesting fish glue. It comes, you come, you get this bladder, and then we cut it up and boil it for hours and hours and strain it so that it's clear. And it's, it's liquidy, it's very viscous. It's also reversible in water. It's important that a lot of our repairs are reversible. So I just want to, mm -hmm. we have one comment that the audio is not quite loud enough, so maybe oh, we okay. need to, to talk a little we'll bit louder, louder in this big space. All right, so I'm talking about. Let us, let us know if you continue to have um, trouble hearing. Okay, so this is our fish glue. It comes as a bladder that we cut up, boil, and turn and strain and turns into a sort of a clear liquid that we then dry and we can easily rehydrate this in water. And that's what I use to adhere this because it is reversible in water. Fish glue, wow. Fish glue. Awesome. So that's another repair. And then this is actually another adopt -a book And this is our Leica lens, which we use to do paper repairs or also to identify paper fibers. Mm -hmm. And this is an interesting book from the American Art and Portrait Gallery that has tissues of different hairstyles that you can put over a head. Hmm. And this needs a lot of work, a lot of repair to this torn tissue, and it's also uh, a little bit dirty, it needs to be cleaned and wrinkled, so it needs to be flattened. But that's sort of a, a very interesting, unique book that we have Great. in our collection. So I thought we could show you some of our equipment that we use every day. Yay, let's go for a tour. We're gonna go on a walk. This is um, our workhorse is our guillotine. We use this for cutting anything from fine Japanese paper to board. It's a board shear. Okay, I think we still need to um, speak a speak little louder. bit louder. Okay, yeah. so this Sorry. is our board shear, and we use it, it can cut something as thick as a board or as thin as Japanese paper. Oh. Look at that go. This is a technology that has not changed in many, many years, and this is actually an older machine that's been refurbished. Wow. This is the guillotine. So this is the board guillotine. here. This is the guillotine that Don will show you how to use. And this is another very old piece of equipment with a, a very heavy, sharp blade, which we use to cut out or chop something really thick. Sometimes uh, a stack of paper or the very edge of a text block. And this is not a collection item that we no, have. No, exactly. This <laughs> is just a right sample. Now. This uh, is just an example. <laughs> right. Don't worry, folks. So. You can see how, how this blade you know, oh, wow. very quickly chop, just like that. Awesome. And when would you use that, Don? Uh, primarily, we would use this if we need to trim off the, the very edge of a text block. Um, other times, we might have just a lot of paper uh, that we need to cut into various sizes, and it's faster to stack it all up in a big stack mm -hmm. and chop it all up and get what we need. Awesome. Yeah. Great. So we are still having some reminders to project our voices. Thank you for the reminders. We do have an uh, uh, exterior mic, but this is a very big space. I think we're getting lost. Our voices are getting lost. So this is our uh, washing station. This is our sink with deionized water and calcium carbonate water. So we can wash and then we can actually buffer with the calcium carbonate if we want. Um, usually for things without illustrations because anything with color you don't want to buffer. So this is a great resource. And once it's washed, these are our drying racks. Um, Katie are, loves the drying I racks. I love the drying rack because I found this and we had a terrible one before. <laughs> so these actually can lift out and you can put the, you can bring them over to the sink. Oh wow. Which is great. Um, and then we let it dry on the drying rack for several hours till it's sort of dry to the touch, the items. And then the final step is to put them under weight between blotters and wool, wool felts. Which so are, can you remind us, um, when would you use, when would you wash something? What? Um, I would often wash something that already has had water damage. So sometimes we, we call them tide marks. When something has been washed, or, or become wet, it, where that uh, dampness stopped, it'll leave a, a dark crease, you know, a wavy line. Mm -hmm. And those can virtually be, in most cases, eliminated by further washing. Oh, okay. So water yeah. heals or fixes yes. water. Yes, water fixes water. This is also something we use primarily for labels on boxes for adopt -a book program or labels for pamphlets. It's a Kensol hot stamping machine. And it, um, we set the type, literally, oh, letter by letter. I've already done that. So. Oh, you can feel it's warm. Yes, so it's a heat process, and then we use 
You can use real gold. This is obviously not gold. It's mm -hmm. a silver foil um, that we place here. And while Katie gets it set up, let me remind you, we are happy to answer any questions that you have uh, about what you see here today or um, if you have any questions about your own things for Preservation Week. Oh, look at that. Ta-da! Not quite there. We probably redo that one, but it's uh, you get the idea, right? Nice. Probably needs a little bit more heat on it. So fancy. Yeah. Thank you. And these are our job backers. This is our latest addition. And we put the books in here when we're either cleaning a spine or we're rebinding and rebacking, re, you know, rounding that spine again once it's been washed and mm -hmm. dried and re-sewn. So before we go off to um, Don's station where he's going to show us a bit about book repair, we do have a few questions about um, how to care and store for 100-year-old books. Don, would you like to take that one? Well, um hundred year old book I primarily it's important to think about the environment where the book is being stored and obviously it's best not to keep a book in a basement or an attic we want to try to keep the book in an environment where we live because that way we know the temperature is probably going to be comfortable for us and for the book mm -hmm. high humidity high heat or very, very, very cold temperatures as well can sometimes damage a book. And the environment is very important, I guess, is mm -hmm. what, the, the first thing I would say. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I would certainly want to keep the book on a shelf upright. Um, it, if it was sort of falling apart and it can't stand upright, then you know, laying it down on its side would be okay. Um, if you want to get really fancy, I suppose using metal shelves is better than wood shelves. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, more than anything, keeping the book away from excess sunlight and in, a, in an environment that is a temperature that is going to be comfortable for you in, in your normal living space is really going to go a long way to keeping the book in good shape, I would say. Great. I don't know if Katie has more to add to yeah, that. Or. That sounds great. Cool. Good advice. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're going to go over to Don's station. Um, and while we go over here and take a look at, um, at what he has set up for us, we also had a question that I think maybe you'll an ask, excuse me, answer while you demonstrate, and that is, uh, do you make your own paste papers and marbled papers for new bindings? Um, typically, we... We sometimes might do that. Uh, it's pretty rare, though. If we need to use marbled paper or paste paper, um, we, we normally will try to order it from a commercial vendor. We don't really use it that often. In, in particular, I guess I don't use it that often because the materials that I'm working on are circulating items, general collection items. And with those, we're not as concerned about matching the, uh, the, the original okay. marble paper. Katie, working on the rare materials, would probably use it more than me. Well, you know, again, we yeah. don't use it a ton because we're trying to retain as much of the original binding as we can, including the paper. So what we tend to do is repair the original marble paper, but sometimes we'll use it in a box situation, a lining of a box, uh, or for decorative reasons on a, a new pamphlet that we're creating. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So why don't you go ahead and show us what you're doing here, Don? Well, one very common uh, repair that we need to do is the repair of paper. And when we're repairing paper, we have a kind of a selection of different Japanese and Korean papers that we like to select for this purpose. And the reason we use these is because they're produced in a variety of weights and tones. And you know, some of them are very, very thin, they're also all very long fibered. You can probably see how the, the fibers kind of sticking out around the edges. And when we're repairing something, um, we want to try and pick a, a, a paper that is going to kind of match the original item that we're fixing. Mm -hmm. The idea is not that we want to try and hide our work, but we want to try to find something that will blend in with the original item and just to make it um, 
aesthetically pleasing, but also try to keep the original presentation that, that's there as much as we can. Mm -hmm. and, and also make the intervention as minimal as possible. Okay. So for example, uh, right now I have this item here. This is a pamphlet from 1904 relating to Brazil. And you can see the corner part here is creased and broken, starting to break off. And so what we want to try and do is strengthen this area and make sure that it doesn't break off completely so we don't want to lose that. And also because this is a circulating item that's going to be in the hands of researchers, right. we want to keep it in, in good shape so they can actually look through it, read it, use it, and be able to see the entire object. Mm -hmm. So why don't you walk us through what you would do? Okay, well, in this case, we, uh, whenever we're doing a paper mend, it's important to try to mend the paper on the side that does not have any text or imagery. Ah, okay. We don't want to put a piece of paper over the top of this because then we're going to end up covering the original image and mm -hmm. obscuring it from someone who might want to be able to look at it for mm -hmm. research purposes. So in this case, conveniently, we have a side, the side that we, want, we can fix is totally blank. And so we'll go over to this side. And I have it resting on, these are just pieces of book board that are covered with blotter and a polyester material called Holytex. And the reason we're using that is it, it supports this book so I can work with the area that I need to fix. And also the, the polyester allows us to use an adhesive and make sure that the, the material and the item doesn't stick to oh, what's okay. underneath it. Mm -hmm. So in this case, again, like I said, we want to try to find a paper that is generally going to match the tone of, of this paper. And we also want to make it minimal and keep it from, I guess, being a, a, a giant... Uh, I saw <laughs> yeah, that's a good word. So, you know, you, you, could, take, you could take a, a paper like this, which is kind of white, mm -hmm. We could slap this big piece of paper over that. Thing, sure, but, that would yeah. fix it, but that looks kind of ugly and it doesn't really match well, and, and it's too much paper for the job. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I see you have these tiny slivers here. Yeah, this is exactly right. So what I have, <clears throat> we've got a little piece here that you can see. This is a toned piece of paper. It's pretty thin, and if I lay it on this, it blends pretty well with the original background. So this is the kind of thing that we want to use to fix this. And what we'll do whoops, is <clears throat> we, ha we want to use wheat starch paste for this because wheat starch paste is reversible. And I, another thing I should mention is every repair we do, <clears throat> we want it to be reversible. Oh, that's a great point. Because in the future, conservation te techniques might change and we want book conservators to be able to look at the work that we did and see what we did and be able to take it apart and fix it again if they need to or maybe they have a better way of fixing it in the future and we want them to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So in this case we'll, we'll take just a little bit of wheat starch paste. We don't want to use a lot because we don't want to oversaturate the original paper and we'll brush it on here and I have this paper just on a piece of mylar because that makes it easy for me to see what I'm doing and, and to pull the paper off when I'm done. And I'm, I'm brushing the wheat starch paste. I want to try to brush it away from the center so that I can stretch out the long fibers that are on this paper and allow them to grab onto the original item. Okay, then we're just going to lift it off and place it over our, our broken area here. And you can see it's just covering just where the crease is. And I also like to take a little brush like this and, and just kind of gently brush down and, and out to, again, extend those fibers and make sure that my repair paper is really stuck on there well. 
And then very importantly, the, the next, the final phase is we want to put some weight on this repaired area. The weight is going to help okay. keep it stuck together and help the paper dry. And how long do you leave it like that? Well, we come back and check every so often. I would say something that small probably won't take more than 10, 15 minutes at most to oh, dry okay. thoroughly. Great. And so then I would come back and check that and, and it should be blended in and dry and barely noticeable mm -hmm. and again, securing that break in the page. Great, and so we've had a couple of questions since uh, Don started his demonstration. Um, about leather bindings oh, and, and also just a quick reminder just to speak up a, a little yes. bit in okay. this nice big space um, so a question about leather bindings and is there uh, anything that you should do to maintain them or keep them from getting brittle over time well we don't really recommend oiling anymore that was something that was done a lot in the 80s um, and so really just keeping it clean and in the right environment is the best thing you can really do for it some leathers do have sort of an inherent vice in them some of them were especially the late 19th century leather was done with some chemicals that uh, create sulfur and will break down over time. And there's not a lot we can do about that. There's mm. a condition called red rot that can happen. And we don't have uh, effective ways to really treat that. We have some things we can do to consolidate it, but it's not going to reverse the damage. Mm -hmm. We also had a question uh, about fungus and mold and how to prevent uh, and treat that after it happens. Well, what you really want to do is prevent mold well, if you can, yes. <laughs> and and that goes back to the environment. You know, keep it in an environment where you live. Certainly not. Don't keep books in the basement if you can avoid it, because that's the environment that a mold will want to grow in. Something damp, where the relative humidity is high. If you already have something that has mold, what can be done is it can be frozen. That will not kill the mold, but it will deactivate the mold, and then you can um, you can vacuum it with a very carefully with some cheesecloth over the nozzle and your vacuum on very, very low. Mm -hmm. And you can also use some of the eraser crumbs to try to remove the mold. But off, often, especially if it's gotten to a sp specific stage and it's dyed and stained the paper, that is not reversible. Okay. And would you recommend that somebody do that something like that themselves or are there resources that people not can find? really, I would suggest. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have a professional organization, the American Institute for Conservation, AIC, and they have a website and they will... Um, they have conservators that they can recommend to you for that kind of work. It is very technical. It is very difficult. And mold is one of the most difficult things we deal with. Uh -huh. All right. So, folks, we are wrapping up here in our book conservation lab. If you have any last questions, please let us know. Otherwise, if we don't get to them, we're happy to answer in comments. And, again, for those of you having um, some sound quality issues, I apologize for that. We'll look into other ways of doing our sound in the future. Um, although some folks are saying they're having a perfectly easy time hearing, so um, we will have to investigate that. But, uh, yeah, so we're wrapping up now. Any last questions, please let us know. And I last pan over this really fantastic facility. Uh, we do have another question, which is, I have a book with brass closing snaps. How does one replace them? Oh, that's a tough one. There are people who will fabricate those, and there are actually commercial websites you can go to where you can find those. They are usually custom made, so they're going to need the actual size and perhaps a picture of what you have on there, and they can replicate that. It is not um, inexpensive, and you probably need a conservator to reattach it to your binding. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I think that just about wraps it up for us today, folks. Right. Thank you so much for joining us in the Book Conservation Thank Lab. You. Thank you, Katie. Thank yeah. you, Don, for this great tour. Um, again, if you have more questions, feel free to leave them in the comments and we'll get back to them this afternoon or later. And thanks so much for joining us. Bye. Bye.